Hi and welcome. I'm Jamia Wilson and I'm an author and vice president and executive editor at Random House. And it is my pleasure to welcome our audience to this panel discussion for the documentary On the Record, directed by Kirby Dick and Amy Ziering, available to watch on HBO Max. Today, we're going to be discussing the very relevant and timely topic of cultural betrayal trauma theory, pioneered by Dr. Jennifer M. Gomez, who is joining our panel today. To frame the conversation, cultural betrayal trauma theory posits that some people of color develop intercultural trust, love, loyalty, attachment, connection, responsibility, and solidarity with each other to protect themselves from a hostile, discriminatory society. Within group violence, such as a Black perpetrator harming a Black victim, is a violation of this intracultural trust. This violation is called cultural betrayal. So the within group violence is called a cultural betrayal trauma. We're going to be discussing this concept in relation to the black community and the violence perpetuated against black women as shown in the documentary on the record. I would now like to introduce our very distinguished panelists and you can see and learn more about them and their important work through their full bios on our website. Dr. Jennifer M. Gomez is an assistant professor at Wayne State University, a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University, and the chair of the Research Advisory Committee at the Center for Institutional Courage. I just love that name. She will, be be she will begin as faculty in the School of Social Work at Boston University in summer 2022. Sherry Sher is an author and an American hip hop pioneer best known as a founding member of the first all-female hip-hop group, Mercedes Ladies. Dr. Joan Morgan is a writer and program director for the Center for Black Visual Culture at NYU, New York University. And I can't help but say it's also my alma mater and that of my grandfather, so that makes me very proud. Jimmy Briggs is a writer, journalist, and justice advocate. And I'd like to begin with Dr. Gomez. Dr. Gomez, your work in this field is so groundbreaking because you're analyzing and providing research of what of the term that you've coined cultural betrayal and how it's occurring in many communities of color. Could you please tell us a bit more about the genesis of this theory and also the reaction from communities of color, especially the black community? Yes, definitely. Um, but I, I can't start until I say that I'm just honored and humbled to be part of this panel um, and I'm geeking out slightly um, by everyone who's who's on the panel. And as a researcher, the hope that you have is that the stuff you're doing at the university actually impacts the real world. And so I'm just grateful um, to be with you all um, to be able to share this. So cultural betrayal trauma theory, the idea um, came essentially from two places. The first was I was a dancer with Dance Suit of Harlem um, years ago when I was a baby. Um, and Arthur Mitchell, the co-founder and director at the time, would talk to us often about that we carry a mantle greater than ourselves. And there was this strong sense of pride and solidarity and fighting the good fights and representing Black people you know, very well um, in the US and around the world with Dan Cito Parlam. And so I had that kind of sense of the importance of the solidarity, as well as when we were touring, you better act right, because we're representing all of Black people <laughs> when we're touring. Um, and the second half comes from Dr. Jennifer Fried, a trauma researcher and founder of the Center for Institutional Courage. And her theory beginning in the 90s was betrayal trauma theory. And so the idea with this is that if you have, let's say, a parent who's sexually abusing their child, it's a betrayal because that child needs the parent for housing, for love, for connection. And so it's a betrayal when you have a parent abuse you in that manner. And so taking these things together of the solidarity at Dan Seed of Harlem and in the black community, and then how when you need someone, um, there's this betrayal aspect. I kind of put them together as cultural betrayal trauma theory. 
So with cultural betrayal trauma theory, you don't have that interpersonal trust, but it's this within group solidarity, like Ubuntu, I am because we are, like we're in this together um, flavor. And then when that's violated through violence, it's this cultural betrayal piece. So you have the kind of normal harm of violence, normal, very toxic, terrible <laughs> harm of violence. And then you also have this additional cultural betrayal piece on top of it. Um, and the research has shown that that cultural betrayal piece also impacts mental health um, above and beyond the, the violence itself. So the reactions, I, in doing this work, I am always sensitive and hoping <laughs> that Black people in particular um, take up this work and don't find it offensive. Um, and we could talk a little bit later on about the odyssey of the reactions over the past 10 years. Um, by and large, at this point, it's a very, very positive reaction. Um, an example, a couple years ago before the pandemic, um, I gave a 10 minute, very short talk on cultural betrayal trauma theory at Motor City Singer Space, which um, is in Detroit and is a, a musical series to destigmatize mental health in the black community. So in front of a hundred Detroiters, I gave like, here's, here it is, here's the spiel. Um, and the response was so positive um, and so loving and so, Right, perceived almost as grateful that we were talking about this out in the open and that it had its language of cultural betrayal to describe this extra like ugh, that goes on with violence um, with a clear recognition at the time that this isn't an kind of all black people thing. All black people are not violent. Um, and when violence happens, it's harmful in this way. Um, so it's been by and large positive um, with a little bit of an odyssey with that over the years. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to talking some more about it too, because I'm, I'm really happy to hear that it's overwhelmingly been positive and uh, I'm intrigued and want to ask some more things. But now I want to ask Sherry a few questions. So Sherry, first of all, thank you so much for your courage. Thank you. Speaking your th truth in the documentary. Uh, I had the honor of seeing you speak your truth at Sundance and yeah. I'm Really uh, honored to be back with you today. And you first wrote about your accusations about Russell Simmons in your book, mm -hmm. Mercedes Ladies, mm -hmm. but you used a pseudonym mm -hmm. rather than naming him directly and didn't come forward with the allegation until 2017 officially. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about why you chose to use a pseudonym for him and not name him previously? what was going on in the cultural landscape perhaps, or what those reasons might've been, but also did you feel like you wouldn't be believed or supported because of the notion that you would be betraying your own people and your own community? Um, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, and it's a pleasure to be with um, everybody on this platform. Um, actually, my book came out um, and published in 2008 by Keniston and Vibe Magazine. Um, at the time they had merged and that's when they did Biggie Smalls. Um, when I decided to, I was writing a book way before that. And actually when, the, when, it, when I was first violated, I came out then, but it was a different time. At that time, um, Russell was the guru of leading uh, hip hop into a major league. So he wasn't, you know, Russell with the fat farm and all of that. So when, when um, I was violated, it was, um, I had people that knew about it, but what they were, uh, they was, it wasn't that they didn't believe me or anything like that. Um, it was just that they was afraid of Russell because some people was choosing money over principles. And at that time, it, as a black young woman growing up there, it wasn't, you didn't have the resources or felt you would have the support. And you're talking about hip hop was just starting so when this happened to me, this is when hip hop was just starting getting light and Russell was just, and you know, he had just, he had Curtis blow out, but he wasn't big time Russell at that time. And um, I had a choice um, when it happened, it was not that I was just with Russell by myself. It was, uh, I had witness there who came out when all of this came out. And I did have the choice that, um, that I should call the cops or tell my mom at that time. I don't know, growing up in the Bronx, if you understood about snitching and all of that, um, it just wasn't, you wasn't gonna be looked at, right? And then I was scared of my mom because she would have been like, well, well, what were you doing over there? And what, you know, So it was a lot that I had. 
And I had to make a choice whether to call the cops, tell my mom and blow this up or what should I do? And uh, my friend that kept telling me to call the cops, she wasn't from the Bronx, she was from Long Island. And she, she was in, you know, of the black American culture. And I was telling her, you don't understand. I just want to go home. So that makes it clear. It did, I, it, I came out then with it, but Russell wasn't as big as he was back then. So when my book got published, I had, a, I had been writing a diary all this time and um, they had did Hip Hop Divas Vibe magazine. So they asked me to come and speak about the Mercedes ladies. And that's when I found out that Vibe and Kenniston was merging at the time. And they was um, putting out street lit books, you know, Vibe street lit books. And they did see murder, Biggie. And then I told them I always had a diary about my journey with Mercedes ladies. So Kenard Gibbs and Rob Kenner was the chief editor at the time. Mimi Valdez was there. They was all involved. And um, they read my diary and it was like, yo, you got to finish writing it. And I was like, uh, I didn't go to college for writing. I'm a hip hop artist. I started the first theme. We was, you know, I write raps, but it was like, no, the way you wrote it, you're going to finish it. So from there on, um, when, when it was time to get published, I had a choice because um, they had the original diary. And they um, asked me, did I want to use Russell name in there? Or, or, or I put it based on a true story. So I had to marinate on that because it was all kind of feelings and emotions that was going through my head. Like what would be the repercussion? Because now we're talking about Russell's fat farm. He's a big mogul. He has a credit card the company out. He's Uncle Rush. He's big time now. And so I had a real serious choice to make. And they told me, uh, you know, you got to make that choice. And um, I thought about it. I had a couple of people like, what are you doing? You should, this is your chance to blow them up. You've been holding this for years. This is your chance. And I just felt like, you know, I wanted my book to be about the journey of the first all female DJ rap group and four amazing women who went up against male arena. And I felt if I would use the book as to put the story about Russell, I think it would have took away from the essence of what I originally wanted my, my story to be about. Rap, uh, Russell was just a chapter in there. So I made that choice and, um, and that's why it was based on a, a novel. And um, I told um, Rob Kenner at the time, he was the uh, editor. And um, I said, look, I, I chose the bit based on a true story, but I went in the back of the book, his name where I'm tagging him. Now this is before tagging was social media and all that was out. Not that I know I was ahead of my time. I said, I want him to name mentioned in the back and tagged him. And he said, okay, well, we'll do that. So when my book came out, um, it was being promoted, but um, it was caught up in a uh, thing because at that time, Keniston found out that Vibe Magazine sold the magazine. And um, so then it was like, I got caught up in that. So I did like college tours. My book got put in the um, rare archive of Bolt of um, Har um, Carnell University. And I was just excited about doing this college tour. And I just was keep going on, um, fast forward. So um, it wasn't that I, um, like a lot of people said, oh, well, you know, you didn't know. I, it, it was out be way before my book came out. A lot, uh, a lot of people was involved that knew about this. And it was just at that time, Russell was just um, bringing hip hop into another league. And, and um, he was the guru of getting people deals and signed and stuff. And it was hard enough for black females at the time and I was like, you know, if I did this now, then Mercedes ladies, we still trying, is he gonna blackball? And then I had the rest of the girls to look at, they're like, what are you doing? And so I had to make a decision. When my book came out, fast forward, 2008, I didn't never in the world think my book would ever get published and it did. And so it fell into now he's in the higher level. And, and I was like, well, will he blackball my book or what is this gonna bring about? And then will it just lose the essence of my story about us young black females that grew up in the Bronx and went up against all male arenas. So I had a lot to think about. Then I had people that felt I made the wrong decision that I should have used my book to blow him up. And I did, and I could have blown him up before he became big. I did, and so it was a lot. And um, at that time, you didn't have many resources or support from your own community because you know hip hop was pretty big coming out and out of the Bronx. So it felt like, I felt like that would have kind of just, 
it, it would have been a lot I would have been against. And thank you so much for speaking on so many things there, but as well as talking about what it means uh, when someone's power, there's already an abuse of power, but then when their influence becomes an outsized influence That's and right. and what that means in terms yeah. of institutional power and culture and um, how that affects survivors of violence as well. And in terms of when you were talking about centering your story and the story of Mercedes ladies being important um, and being important in terms of focusing the power on what you were doing and what you all were doing as trailblazers in hip hop, it made me think of Joan and Jimmy and how um, they have written about the hip hop world throughout many phases of it. Uh, and I wanted to, to ask them, Dr. Morgan and Jimmy, do you feel that the hip hop culture at the time um, contributed to allowing or accepting violence and harassment of black women? And as a follow-up, has that culture changed from many decades ago or is there some nuance in the in-between? Um, I can take that. I can start. Um, you know, I don't really think there's any difference in terms of time and that there's a blanket time where Black uh, violence against Black women is unilaterally laterally opposed and supported. I think that we, it, we just have not seen that um, in history. And so I think hip hop was very reflective of the continued, not just misogyny, but the many reasons that people uh, do not champion behind violence against women, particularly in hip hop culture. And so I think that there are um, a couple of reasons uh, for that, least of which just patriarchy is an ongoing uh, terrible thing. Like we just haven't gotten rid of that yet. But you know, hip hop in particular, um, and I think this is where Dr. Gomez's theory is, is important when we talk about like community, right? So there, on one level, there is this idea, particularly in the beginning, that hip hop is a small community. Like, you know, I mean, Sherry's talking, I was one of the original staff writers at Vibe. Mm -hmm. So you don't really get to have these conversations and every single person like knows each other. I think people don't remember this about the time period. So the artists that I'm writing about, I see them out in the club. Like, you know, there is an intimacy. Many a hip hop journalist got beat down for something that they wrote in an article. So I think that people don't really understand or lose track because we're talking about a, a multi-billion dollar industry now that is international. They forget the intimacy and the intimate dangers um, and what Sherry was saying um, about the sort of cultural feeling about snitching, right? Like you just you just don't do it. So there's all of that um, that's going on. That's one level, but on a far more practical and probably cyn cyn uh, cynical note, the reality is hip hop is the hottest party around, and there are gatekeepers, right? And Russell is one of the biggest gatekeeper so you will start to find yourself disinvited from things you will start to find yourself your roads that and access that you need open and to, particularly if, we, if you're a woman in this field on any level if you're an artist if you're a director if you're a makeup artist any you're a writer any of those things if you're a woman in this you are already marginalized in terms of your access and so if you decide then to, it's easy to say, blow them up, tell your story, whatever, but you have to make the real practical consideration of, do I want my career shut down? Do I want to be, um, I have to say, um, when, it, when Sherry was telling the story, cause I actually didn't really know the piece about Mimi and, and Rob that, the fact that Vibe even stood up and said, we will give you the opportunity to tell this story with the name and, and uh, name, uh, name your um, assailant is pretty unusual actually for um, hip hop. It, it, not, it wouldn't have been anything for a publication to say, 
you know, we just can't really touch that story. Mm -hmm. um, and part of it is reverence for the guru figure, but part of it is straight up like, you just don't want your shit shut down. Yeah. yeah it's, it's hard to follow Joan after what she just said, the, the, the depth of what she just said. I, I think just to add in, um, it's great to see you, Joan, and Sherry share since uh, January of 2020 at Sundance. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Dr. Gomez, so excited to be in conversation with you. I'm a huge fan of your work and, and what you're pushing in our communities. I, just to add on to what, what, what Joan was saying, but little I can add to that, um, I think what strikes me about that period in particular, Jamia, is um, kind of the iconography, the, the visuals. I mean, the, being a visual journalist, I mean, I'm, I'm so, I still recall, you know, just the, the, the pernicious, pernicious um, really blatant exploitation of women in videos, um, in magazine spreads, um, just just how how the hip hop culture at that time, less so now. Although I agree with Joan that I don't think it's changed much, um, nor, nor has has there been any kind of um, you know holistic um, multi gender conversation within hip hop about about what, what she or she experienced and what you know the other women and, and um, on the record uh, talk about. Um, I think just. What struck me then, and it seems less so that's the case now, is just the, the blatant exploitation, misogyny, um, the, the physical uh, objectification of women, and how, you know, as Joan says, it was a reflection of what was what, what is what is happening in the community. It wasn't it wasn't anything that 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 was exaggerated. It's what was happening and was still happening. Um, and I think you know one of the things that I would have hoped, and, and Joan, if Joan probably speak to this better than I can, one of the things I would have hoped would have happened. In, in the 10, 20, 30 years, um, you know, over the, over the, the, as the modern contemporary span of, of hip hop culture is, is having conversations like this, where all men in hip hop have these conversations. I mean, I, I don't take it lightly. I, I mean, I'm actually honored to be a part of this conversation, but I, it, 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 it saddens me that, you know, more men aren't in this conversation. I mean, and that, you know, you know myself, Daddy, and others, you know, we're not alone, but where, where are the, the, the name artists, the, the, you know, the, the, the global commercial artists? Why aren't they speaking about this? They didn't speak about it then, they're not speaking about it now. And I, I think there's really, you know, we talk about a racial reckoning in this country, you know, in the, in the wake of, of uh, George Floyd, George Floyd's murder, and Breonna Taylor and some other people, especially last year. Where's the reckoning for the hip hop community with the, 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 the really toxic, misogyny and, and I would say hatred of women, black women and like women in particular, that, that was, was depicted in, in the 90s and the early 2000s um, and, and reckoning around the impact on our young people. What did it tell young people about, our, about themselves that this is, this, is how you, this is how you get ahead, that the, the, the white um, music industry, white, largely white led and controlled music industry is going to reward you for exploiting your sisters and, and, and being bound towards your sisters for commercial gain. I think that that's what I'm waiting for to happen now at this point within hip hop culture. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, I really appreciate you talking about that as well um, because um, I think that ties into some of the questions um, that I was thinking about earlier too around uh, the positive reception to Dr. Gomez's work as well, because um, I have a question for Dr. Gomez about that that makes me connect to the last things we talked about. Did you see that there was a difference in reception generationally within the community as well as uh, across gender? I So generationally across gender. So what I saw in the early years, so I proposed this first in 2012, so almost 10 years ago. Um, in the early years, what I saw is that um, people who were more fair um, and who were probably male uh, took the stance of your saying that we're all victims, that we're all victims of racism and that we're kind of just cast aside. My family's worked very hard to be successful. They were upper middle class or upper class, you know, and I remember listening and being like, you're black, but you could like pass for Italian and you're wealthy, you know, and you think that this is all about you that you just worked hard and that's how you got here. You're not looking at the fact that you're light-skinned and you're rich and you're male um, in this situation. So I got kickback from that um, in the early years. Um, generationally, I think it was also, so it was 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, we were not talking about racism the way that we are now publicly. So 10 years ago, the younger people were saying, that's a thing of the past. 
like racism is not this big thing that you're making it out to be that would cause intercultural trust to be needed and solidarity or would cause any cultural betrayal. Um, and so I think the the world has gotten better in terms of like, like just the, the public discourse around this has gotten better. Um, and we've been able to name different privileges um, in a way that we didn't kind of in the public discourse 10 years ago. In my experience, I think older people, people who aren't the millennials, at least, um, so like my age and older, I'm turning 37, um, have had a better understanding from earlier on that this seemed like a thing. Whereas younger people and younger black people 10 years ago and 15 years ago were told that this is done. We're in a colorblind society, this is all fine. Um, and the misogyny um, and the um, kind of automatic disrespect and degradation of black women was straight up normal. There, there was no Me Too publicly. There, what it was just like this is what it is. If you're, if you're a black woman, um, and if you're attractive or perceived as attractive, then what do you expect? Um, and and harkening back even to Anita Hill testifying against um, or about Clarence Thomas's sexual harassment before he was confirmed as a Supreme Court justice, and it just being um, in her book Speaking Truth to Power, she talks about that. Yeah black people believed her but it was how dare you say something this is a black supreme court seat we've lost Thurgood Marshall we need Clarence Thomas never mind that Clarence Thomas was never a friend to black people policy wise mm -hmm. didn't matter much less a sexual harasser didn't matter um and so I think being able to see it in that context and me growing up in the 90s all I heard about Anita Hill were jokes on sitcoms and Clarence Thomas it was never that she was a serious person um, and black sitcoms would make jokes about it, right? Um, and it wasn't until I was older when I was like, oh, she's a straight up legend and this was wretched and he's still on the Supreme Court. Um, and this was done in the name of blackness and who does blackness get to include? Um, it's not often black women. Mm. Yeah, there's so much to unpack there and uh, although I do have another question for you, it's just making me think about when you pointed out, um, you know, the cultural reinforcement of this idea that you can't betray the culture uh, with the sitcoms. It was making me think about what I was consuming at that time. We're about the same age. I'm a few years older than you are, but around the same era of sitcoms. Yeah. What I was wondering is when you were talking about um, Anita Hill, it just led me to think about specifically some women politicians who spoke out against men politicians in the past few years, both on the same party, both uh, running more progressive campaigns and seeing the same sort of tropes uh, that had been used in our community around you can't betray the culture or you can't betray progressive candidates because that will hurt people of color that will hurt other women, et cetera. And so it led me to think about how, although I understand and think it's important that this theory focuses on um, the communities that we're talking about uh, more specifically today, I wondered about if, um, if you also have been looking into how it affects the larger conversation about rape culture. Um, and uh, what really struck me about the wisdom of what you said is because when we think of Anita Hill, um, when, uh, Dr. Blasey Ford came forward. And when we also saw all the conversation around the Supreme Court, it was kind of outrageous to see how much pushing um, Black cultural catalysts had to use to make sure that Anita Hill's pioneering work had been mentioned in that conversation. So that's what led me to ask that question as well, because I, I, I think there's a connection between, you know, the work, for example, that Dr. Morgan did and Sherry did uh, leading into longer conversations that are happening now outside of our community as well? Yeah, it's a brilliant, brilliant question. Um, and so I think that, it, let me put it this way. In this country, it is fine to rape women. That, that is where we are. Um, and that's true for all women. Um, and so you see then across, across cultures, across, across races, some similarities around how can we best silence women after they've been sexually assaulted? And you see some similarities around, around that, um, including within the Democratic Party um, and with, with Trump um, and, and all of the massive racism and white supremacy getting um, 
to say stronger, more emboldened, it's always been here. Um, and so I think there are similarities. I think import, there are important differences culturally. And I, I wrote a piece for the Black commentator a few years ago comparing Anita Hill with Chris, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. Um, and what I said there um, is that it's 27 years, we're in the same place. <laughs> Brett Kavanaugh was fully um, confirmed as a Supreme Court justice for the rest of his life. Um, and some things were different. Yes, yeah, so what I noticed is that for Christine Blasey Ford, the responses that I heard was she's kind of hysterical, doesn't remember properly, fragile white woman kind of flavor. Um, Whereas for Anita Hill, what you saw was, yeah, we all know it, be quiet. You worked in a law firm. What did you expect he was gonna do as your female in the firm? Those are both silencing, um, but they're actually quite different. And for Anita Hill, what she had that Christine Blasey Ford did not was what Sherry's been talking about, what Dr. Morgan has been talking about of this keep problems in house, do not talk about it. Um, and not that it's like uncomfortable, it's that you could be threatened, violently pushed out career-wise, like there are real repercussions to this. And so I think the similarities are important to see across um, and uh, solidarity across women is important. Um, but I worry if we do that too much, particularly as black people, the people who are more privileged, the white women, then their needs get kind of get taken over and then ours are still pushed to the bottom um, outside of the black community and then within. No, I think that's an important parallel because I think one of the things that keeps, uh, beg begs the question for me often is um, when the people who are benefiting from the abuse of power, even those who may share marginalization based on skin color, and I'm thinking specifically black male perpetrators, right? Mm -hmm. um, I also think, you know, what connects them to the, um, white cis male perpetrators as well and and or what you know what is it about our society that um would lead uh would lead that to seem like almost a sort of equality to some people that oppression being akin to a kind of equality um so i really appreciate you entertaining that question because it's something i've definitely been working through and thinking through i had another question in that vein you co-authored a piece, Dr. Gomez, last year, addressing the accusations against Russell Simmons specifically. Um, and I wanted to know a bit about why um, you wrote it. Did you write about it specifically as a part of the public discourse about cultural betrayal trauma theory, or was there another, another point of interest? Yeah, it's so... It would have been great if I had the mindset of that this would be a way to get culture betrayal out in the world. I didn't. Um, what happened was Russell Simmons went on The Breakfast Club in June 2020 um, and was abhorrent. Um, and somebody sent me the transcript and I was so incensed by what he talked about. I pulled in Dr. Robin Gobin, who's a, a trauma researcher, clinical psychologist, um, author of The Self-Care Prescription and Black Woman and said, can you believe what this fool just said? Um, on this show. So some of what he said is he talked about um, toxic femininity, which does not exist, but he made it a thing um, and said that, that that's what happens when women um, aren't strong and don't assert their boundaries and that they regret it later. Um, and he wants his daughters to be strong and be leaders and have boundaries. I was totally incensed. Um, and the first thing I'll say about that um, is I don't know if I've ever witnessed more strength, more courage than from Sherry, than from all the women who spoke in on the record at this just concentrated strength. Um, the second thing is that it's quite a high level manipulative victim blaming. <laughs> so if I'm Russell Simmons, who's being accused by lots of women, I say, you know what, let's talk about the women. Let's police their behavior and let's say what they're doing wrong, according to me, who's been accused of all of this violence against women. And so what Dr. Gobin and I did in that piece um, is we said that black women and girls are never responsible um, for black men's abusive behavior, period. We said um, it's never okay to rape anybody. We shouldn't have to say this, but it appears that we do. So we said it. Um, and then later on the article, we talked about, okay, 
when I read the transcript from Russell Simmons, I was embarrassed as a black person of like, these aren't black men that I know. Like I know black men who would never rape anybody, who would never degrade anybody. And so what can those black men do? <laughs> like Jimmy was talking about, what can black men do who, who do not behave in this way, not condone it? And so we said the first thing is do not listen to Russell Simmons on what to do when he's been accused of sexual violence in all these different ways, number one. Um, and we talked about how for black men, your capability to not rape anybody is the same as that your buddy on the street who just did rape somebody. So do not make excuses for them. You, you're in the world, being black, being male does not, is not synonymous with being a rapist or being a sexual abuser. You're not abusing anybody. So don't make it okay down the street for him to do it. Um, and as Jimmy was saying earlier, I've also noticed the silence and noticed the, the black celebrities who won't speak about R. Kelly, they're his friend, they're not gonna discuss it one way. Why not? It's 30 years of sexually abusing girls. We all know it. We all know it. And so in this piece, trying to kind of poke and empower black men and that this solidarity that we speak of needs to be a positive thing. It's good to have solidarity. It cannot and should not be used as a negative that solidarity means we will not call black men raping girls, women, children, that that's not a betrayal. It's just a betrayal if you're speaking about it. That is absurd. Um, and we don't have to do this. I um, mean, we can do something different. And so it wasn't, it wasn't something I intended to do. It's a great public case study um, with, with Russell Simmons. Um, but it was just, I was so infuriated and still am by the audacity um, to speak as he did. Thank you so much. And I I, you know, as I've caught my breath after hearing about the audacity um, and some of the comments that were made, it truly took my breath away. Um, I wanted to uh, ask Jimmy to jump in because I know that Jimmy has denounced violence against Black women by Black men, denounced violence against women in general, and has done a lot of work uh, around solidarity. And wanted to ask Jimmy to engage us a bit about what black men can do to support black women and also uh, survivors specifically, but also how can we make sure that we're effectively communicating this message across generations? I first have to say, I, I, I'm, through this conversation, I'm becoming much, even much more of a fan of yours, Dr. Gomez. <laughs> like, I can listen to you talk all day, actually. I just want to get that out there. Um, I just have a little things first, Jamila. Um, and, 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 and I know Joan and Sherry feel strong about this. Um, again, toxic femininity is not a thing. And usually, you know, when, when especially in communities of color, especially in the black community, when we talk about we, we want to raise our girls strong, that usually means we want to, usually strong means silent. So you don't, you don't, you don't speak out, you don't say anything. And so I, I think, you know, I don't, as a father of two daughters, I'm raising my, my, my girls strong, but I'm also raising them to be vulnerable and honest and have voice. And say when they're when they're when the harm is happening to them. And it's interesting, you know. I love the question you asked, Dr. Gomez, previously, Jimmy, because it, it, having this conversation right now is so it seems so so perfect in, in this period of time because we're, we're seeing, you know, the manifestation nationally of of, of so-called white woman missing white women's syndrome. You know, with this recent case of, of the woman in, in the western part of the United States. When those of us who've been tracking these things know that women and girls of color, black girls in DC, indigenous women across the United States, Latina women across the country have been missing and accounted for for years. There's never been, there's never been an outcry, there's never been an outpouring of support and empathy. There's never been the energy we're seeing this one case of this young white woman who's, who's disappeared now. And so I, you know, I, I would even go further and just say, you know, not only does America as a society have a great cultural problem against women, but I think America has a problem against women of color, black women especially. And I think that, you know, black men, the, the best thing we can do to support black women is to actually check each other, but also hold each other accountable. When, the, when violence happens, when there's misogynistic statements being made, then we have to, we have to speak out. We have to hold each other accountable in private and publicly. To, to, to Dr. Goldman's, Dr. Goldman's point that, you know, for years we've known about R. Kelly, no one said anything. For years we knew about Bill Cosby, no one said anything. Uh, for years people have known about Russell Simmons, no one said anything. 
And it's not just, it's not, I, mean, I, I so honor Sherry stepping forward and talking about her experience, but we need black men to hold our sisters up. I often, and I, you know, this may be a provocative or painful question for some, but I often, as a black man, I often ask, when do black, women, black men show up for black women? You know, we didn't, we don't show up. We didn't, you know, it took black women, Monique Morris and Kimberly Crenshaw to create the Say, Say Her Name campaign for Breonna Taylor and Sandra Bland and others. It took black women, uh, and I'm being from Missouri, and I know this for a fact, it took black women to, to march and protest in Ferguson when Michael Brown Jr. was killed. It took black women to start the Black Lives Matter uh, movement as part of the larger civil rights struggle. It, you know, black men have to step up for, for the safety, for, for, the, for, the, for the defense, uh, for the allyship publicly with black, black women. We don't do that as a, we don't do that right now. We don't. That's just the, that's just the facts. So as black men, as men of color, we have to show up for our sisters. We can't just hang back and let them push the struggle ahead, you know, for, on our behalf. We can't we can't ask black women to continue subjugating their ambitions, their safety, their success for for our accomplishments, for our achievements, for our, for our wealth accumulation. That's been the history of of of, of blackness in this country since slavery. Black black women do the work, but hang back when the shine comes. Black women step in the sunlight. Black men skip the sunlight. And so I think, you know, Joan said it before, hip, the hip hop culture from the beginning has been a reflection of the realities of our community. But the, 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 the reflection has, is not just at the level of Russell Simmons or Bill Cosby or R. Kelly or Kobe Bryant or whoever. The reflection has to happen in our everyday communities, in our families, for those of us who aren't celebrities, who aren't proximate to celebrities. What conversations are we having in our homes? You know, what are we, what are we saying to, what are we saying to, the, to each other? And what, what's the space we're not creating for our sisters, our grandmothers, our aunties, our, our sisters and nieces, our daughters, to speak about the trauma we know that they're enduring based on statistics, but they feel they, they because they have to be strong and be silent. They can't, they're not able to give the space to, to, to speak about trauma, to speak about violence, to speak about pain in a way that's, that's supportive, that's nourishing, that's restorative. We attack our sisters when they step forward and talk about, the pain that black men have caused them. And that has to stop. We have to be, as black men, to, to, be, to really be men, we have to own the violence that we, we commit against black women. It's not it's about selling out, it's not about airing dirty laundry, it's about healing as a community. Because until we, until we talk about the violence we commit against ourselves, how can we actually realistically dismantle white supremacy that affects all of us? So I just so appreciate you saying that because you know we've seen in Dr. Morgan's work and Dr. Gomez's work, an acknowledgement of how this pressure within our culture is also connected and in reaction to the real threats um, and impact of systemic oppression. And um, to this point in the documentary, in the documentary, uh, Dr. Morgan says, many black women will allow race loyalty to bring them an early tombstone because they cannot reconcile the idea of engaging in a criminal justice system that has been so brutal to black men. Um, do you feel, Dr. Morgan, that this is a double bind situation exacerbating the trauma of survivors? Um, I really want to ask this because um, I personally have engaged this when I've been um, a survivor of a crime and um, having had to make the decisions of uh, whether or I wanted a restorative justice approach and knowing that the other alternative wasn't an approach um, that was going to work for me um, in terms of what justice felt like for me. And so I'm, I'm really curious about what your thoughts are about that. And um, I think it connects very deeply to what Jimmy was saying as well. So I, you know, I, I wrote that. I clearly think that that is uh, true. But I think that, you know, that I wrote that 20 years ago. So I, I've had some time to connect the dots. And I, and I want to go back to what Jimmy is saying is that there, there is a very uneven contract between black men and black women, which says that we have that loyalty towards you. We will struggle with that loyalty. Uh, to, uh, internally, we will not report you to the police. We will, I have certainly had situations where I'm at a club or out and someone has touched me inappropriately and I'm with my man and I don't say anything because I am, intimately aware of how that could escalate. And I just take, I just take the L. Like, like we make those negotiations all the time. But I think at the root of all of this, we have to get to what Jimmy is talking about is that 
there has to be a real interrogation by Black men who are capable of how you define manhood and power. Your original examples for power are the people who enslaved you. And you have them, not only as your role model, but what you aspire to. And in your aspiration, you have learned that abusing Black women is a ticket to getting the kind of power and moving through society in the way that you do. You also know that we are, we see ourselves in the kind of cultural bond that Dr. Gomez is talking about because we don't have anyone else in our minds who, logically, if it's not black men who are gonna protect us, who should it be? And so we don't give up on you. You know what I mean? We, we, we will be out there and march, march with you. I, I was so frustrated at the beginning of um, the protests um, when George Floyd was, was murdered that black women, who, black women, black trans women weren't being given um, the same kind of attention that I was like, let's, what would happen if black women just said, I'm not marching for shit until you show up? What does that look like? What does that look like if I tell you, take your ass out there by yourself, I'm not showing up until you give me the respect of showing up for me the way that I show for you. And as black women, we have a very difficult time drawing that line in the sand. I probably have a less difficult time at this point after 30 years of writing about the same shit over and over again. It's less hard for me, but those are the things that we don't challenge black men on because we are scared to death that we're gonna be left alone in this. And the truth is we're left alone in it anyway. Right? Yep. So I actually, what Jimmy is talking about is so important, but I actually want y'all to do, do that work over there with y'all. Like for real, like don't even even involve me in it at this point. Because until you clean house, until you realize that there is no such thing as a toxic femininity, right? <laughs> that you have to like really come to grips with how you define masculinity and power. And this is a moment where hip hop is actually really instrumental because little Nas makes you do that. You know what I mean? He, he makes you do that. He put to take uh, homophobia and put it and uh, put it front and center in a conversation makes us challenge how we think about black masculinity. And the tr truth mm -hmm. is black women have got to make some really difficult decisions mm -hmm. that are probably a little less difficult if you realize you're living with that anyway, that the cultural contract simply does not apply to us because we will take the L, we will have the race loyalty. It will put us in the ground and black men simply do not show up in the same way. Before everybody hits me up, this is really not about me saying they're not black men who love their wives, you know, take care of their daughters, mm. take care of their families, talking about something much broader than that. And for too many of those men, you think that because you're doing what you're supposed to do, that your responsibility stops there. And that is a huge problem. And can I just add, that was yeah. so um, brilliant, Dr. Morgan. Um, I just add that the research backs up everything that she's saying. So I have a piece in the conversation from 2019, the unique harm of sexual abuse in the black community. And in there, I showcase a study with diverse young women of color, um, almost 200. And what I found in that study is that this cultural betrayal trauma is associated with mental health like PTSD. Okay, that's what we've been talking about. So is intracultural pressure which is this racial loyalty, which is everything that Dr. Morgan just discussed. So it is the violence, but it's also the community response and the keep problems in house and be quiet and this is your fault. And if you, if you tell on him and the police kill him, that's on you if they do, you know what I mean? All of that pressure that the black women are responsible then for the black men's behavior, responsible for the white supremacy, responsible for the police, the therapists, so everybody. Um, and that that's also harmful to mental health. And what that means, that's bad news, right? But what that means is that we could change that part. So as we're working to stop people from being violent, that those who are, we can also be working as Dr. Morgan is saying, to have all you black men who are doing the right thing in your homes, 
do it with everything else, hold each other accountable, all of those things at a larger level, and we can interrupt the mental health negative things that happen as a result from cultural betrayal trauma. Thank you so much. And I wanted to ask Sherry, you know, we, we've been talking about a, a span of time and a long span of time, and then now we have had a, a shorter span of time, but some time and some major global events that have happened mm -hmm. since the initial release of On the Record. And I wanted to ask, do you feel now that the film has been out in the world, do you feel that there's more support now um, from the community, do you feel like um, there might even be more support from some people who might not have um, been amplifying their belief in the past or didn't want to be supportive? Um, where are you on your journey of processing the events of the past, but also um, do you think that there's been a shift or that you feel um, like shifting is coming or is possible? Um, first of all, I think anything is possible. Um, since the film, do I see where it's been such a big change? No, absolutely not. Um, it's still going on. And um, even like uh, Joan said, like in the, in the, in the hip hop culture is big. And so it's very inf influential. And so everybody's following the culture. And it's sad to say that it's, it's, still, it's, still, the, it's still the same thing going on. Um, and, but now I think it's to where it's, it's, it's about money more than about principles. So, um, you're not going to have people stepping up and saying anything because they're going to not get the record deal or they're not going to get that push or they're not going to be able to get on different forums because they are speaking out. And, um, it's, it's just a whole culture that started from like, like I said, I grew up in the Bronx and that just was the culture. You didn't snitch on anybody. And that, and I, in a way that kind of saved Russell because if, I think if I would have snitched back then, who knows if they would have been a fat form or anything else, I don't know. But, you know, I didn't snitch and, and you just, it's just a culture that's following each other. And I don't think, I think it, people are more aware of it from seeing on the record, but I don't think it, it was, and to my eyes, it hasn't been no major um, changes or impact on it. I, I still see certain things and still see, um, like if you look at the, when it came out and all the platforms, um, it was not supported by a lot of black platforms and people that had voices on the social media. It was not spoken about, it was nothing said. It was maybe, oh, some accusers came out on Russell, then it was nothing else you had it. And if you look, they had more Russell interviewing him on there, like he was the victim, you know what I mean? And he, you know, even when he mentioned about his daughters and he teach them boundaries, I, some of us, we, I wasn't grown up. My, I was, I didn't grow up with a father. My mom was a single parent of 10 kids. You understand? And I didn't grow up with a father. So I grew up there learning about things just going out there in the streets, I just fell in love with hip hop. And that's what made me like, oh, there's no women doing this. Let me, let's start a woman group, you know, that with that. But as far as boundaries and stuff, my, Russell came in to my house, met my mom and seen she was a single parent. So for him to even say that, and I was my mom's daughter. And just cause it wasn't a father in the house, my mom, you know, trusted us as far as what our career with um, Russell Simmons, I never, at the time heard of him doing this to anybody else. So it was just, I felt all alone, even though my, everybody, people that was around knew about it. I felt alone, like come out and I never heard nobody else say that Russell poked them or touched them or nothing like that. And it was just, it, it just was like, wow, I just gotta eat this, take the L, take the L for the neighborhood, take the L for the culture, just take the L. And despite of not dealing with Sherry and you was hurt, Sherry, you was violated. And I had to just take that and because you, you know, you're raised to be strong. You always, you're raised to be strong when you grow up in certain neighborhoods or certain cultures in the Bronx, you know, you just take the L and you, and you just keep walking. And okay, my thing was, I wasn't gonna let him think he warned me because I continue, I end up writing my book and publish, I continue doing what I do. But I never, the film made me I never dealt with me and dealt with Sherry wasn't okay what happened to you. Sherry, you deserve to come out and tell, and you deserve to face the giant. 
and it took a lot for me and and to come out and then when these women came out I knew uh spiritually I had to do it because I wrote about it it happened to me and I kind of had the blueprint like this is Russell <laughs> this is what he does and never in a lifetime would I ever thought 30 years later that all these women would come out. I just was like, so I think it was, I had to come up and speak up and tell what happened. And, and it was nothing that I hid and didn't talk about. It just was in the, in the, in the hood and you just didn't say nothing. And okay, rap is going to the mainstream media. Um, my mom was, before she passed, she was very upset that I um, held that from her. That, and she just told me, don't worry, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to be told, it's going to take a life of its own. And I was like, oh, you know, and she passed on and never knew that I know years later, it did take a life, it did come out and, and I was able to tell my story and it was kind of healing to me. And um, it's just sad on another level because a lot of black men out here do have certain issues and mental health in the black community is never addressed. And so everything is just to it like oh that's just him he's just like that oh that's just the clearance he's just like you know you grew up like that and that's just the way the it, the, the tone was set for us and not knowing some men know their friends are doing certain things or but they're not going to out them or nothing like that because you know that's my boy I ain't out him and then as a woman I don't want to see another black man being beat down and going to prison so you just have, like Joan said, it's just a lot of weight on you as a black woman. And we're taught this as we grow up to protect our black men, to protect our community because they already beat down. You know, we had uncles and grandfathers that grew up in slavery, they was beat down. So how dare we as a black woman go and beat our man down too? Take that L for the community, take that L for our brothers. And that's just what we was taught. And that's just how we was brought up. And for your question, do I think it, it it's a big change in the hip hop culture? I mean, it's certain things that came out and the person got away and they and it's okay that they did it and it's just like, oh, I just took that L. It's still happening. So no, I don't think so. I think it's the love and hip hop is the it's the money and the stature and the status and who you are. And you know, if you if you're if you're trying to come up, you got a lot to think about. Like you're actually, it is black ball in the business and it is stuff like that, that exists. And then you're like, do I give up my career or do I blow this person up and bring another attention to me? And so it's just a lot that you're up against. And um, I think at the end, you just gotta really know who you are and understand whatever's meant for you is gonna be for you. And it's, it's not that you're outing or doing this for them you're doing it for yourself for empowerment of yourself and respect for yourself and let people know no it's not okay that you violated me it's not okay what you did you know what you did you can sit there to the world and act like oh this was nothing oh they get over it oh but at the end of the day when you're looking at mirror you know what you did and that's that's soul and stuff like that don't matter how much money you got you know what you did and for me I'm, I released a lot and it was for me to take my power back and to say, I have so much to give and I'm not gonna let nobody silence me no more about, because afraid to come out. So on that note, you know, I think it's hope for the future. I'm, this panel right here is, was excellent, you know, and I think it should be more of that, but I think a lot of people are just more um, based on their popularity and their status more than let's make a change or let's have principles or let's stand behind these uh, women or anybody who's violated, let's stand behind them and, and, and make a difference. It's not like that. I mean, it's more about who I am and status and wow, I made it to the big league. I'm not going to, I'm not going to risk what I made to, you know, help blow this up or this cause. It's just like that. And it's sad as, I mean, it happens all over, but with people of color is more prevalent because it's just that, we're not gonna have that resources and support that we need from our brothers and sisters on any level because they're afraid that they're not trying to give up their bag and they're not trying to give up their popularity and status. And that's just, that's just the way it is. Jamea, and that's I, just my feeling. 
I'm sorry, Sherry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's okay. Something really quickly. Um, I think you have to really, like, this is what I mean about, like, we have to connect the dots, right? So the number, Dr. Gomez probably has the more updated statistic on this. I don't know exactly what it is. But the number of women who say that they have been experienced some form of sexual assault was something like one out of, really high, like one out of three, I think, in, in the United States. And the number was higher for Black women, right? So you have to, we have to come to the to grips with, it's not like, oh, there's some few exceptions and these are really bad guys, but I don't want to say anything to take a successful down. So many of you are not saying anything because you've also done it. You've done it. You're holding your breath thinking, okay, I just hope, I don't want to bring any attention to myself because that could be me too. So the me too, the incredible cultural movement that like ends up putting a Harvey Weinstein in jail. And trust me, as somebody that came up in entertainment, nobody ever thought that could happen. But it did. Everyone was sitting around who's done like, who's dealt with like black music and entertainment being like, oh boy, that's really, this is before I knew anything about on the record. Like, okay, when is it gonna hit? When is it gonna hit? When is it gonna hit? And it didn't hit, right? And part of the reason that it doesn't hit is the same people as we're define, redefining, the, the culture at large is redefining masculinity. What is appropriate? Um, kind of uh, interaction with women. What is sexual assault? Many men in that black men in that redefinition process are also assailants. So it is not like we're ever go they're going to be the ones to sit up and champion us when they've done the same shit. Like I really have to say that we have to look at those numbers. Thank you so much. And I, I feel like this conversation was so fiercely passionate and important. And I wish we had even more time than we have because we need to be having more of this conversation and be having it more often. And I want to thank each of you for all of your wisdom, all of the work that you do seen and unseen every day uh, to change the conversation and change the world. And I'd like to conclude this discussion with the following quote and statements. Malcolm X said that the most disrespected person in America is the black woman. The most unprotected person in America is the black woman. The most neglected person in America is the black woman. And Me Too founder Tarana Burke said in this film that black women's need and really duty that we feel to protect black men is definitely a hindrance to protecting ourselves. There's this added layer in the black community that we have to contend with oh, so you're gonna put this before the race because you let this thing happen to you. Now we have to pay for it as a race. We're silenced even more. I hope that we can reflect on this and reflect on these truths that span generations um, and think about how each of us can help change the narrative and show solidarity with survivors of violence um, that perpetuated by our own people and beyond. I thank each of you for your courage and for your voices and those you amplify um, that aren't in this room. And I'd like to ask our viewers to continue to talk about this topic within your communities and to do the work yourselves uh, with fierce accountability and love. Thank you so much.